All right. Welcome to CPSC 526, the introduction lecture. So the general themes of this course is that computers do precisely what they're told. They are just machines that are given instructions, and then they faithfully execute those instructions. This is a part of the problem of security, is that if you have a security vulnerability, the computer isn't aware that it exists. It'll just do what it's told to do, which can be not in the best interest of the person who owns the computer. A second theme is that code is data and data is code. Mentally, we think of these things as being separate. We have code, which is the program, and we have data, which is the input, or what's stored in a variable, or a file. But a program is stored in a file, and the code is just binary values that tell the machine what to do. And when you're using a language like Python, you might have a string, which you can then evaluate, and the string is Python code, and that string can be evaluated and then effectively run as code. And other languages have the same sort of features, such as JavaScript. Or if you're familiar with a buffer overflow, this is where in C or C++, you accidentally overwrite the location of the program counter that keeps track of what line of code to run next or where to return to after your function's done. And you have it point to some block of code that you can control and then run that code instead of the code that should be there. You're running data as code. And if you think back to 3.13, Turing machines, when we proved that the halting problem is undecidable, how did we do it? Well, we took a Turing machine, which is a code, and we fed it as input the encoding of a Turing machine, which is data. And the behavior of the machine was to simulate the input. The universal Turing machine takes as input a program and runs it, right? It's taking data and treating it as code, right? So this distinction between data and code is not as clear as it would seemingly be when you just think abstractly as a computer program. There's some code that runs on some data. In fact, the, the lines between these two are quite blurry. A third common theme is that it is features and convenience that creates vulnerabilities. And this can include features of the programming language itself. For instance, having an evaluation statement, an eval statement in JavaScript or Python, it's a convenient feature, but it leads to vulnerabilities. Because if you just run whatever input someone gives you, it could contain some bad instructions. Finally, there's no such thing as 100% secure, no matter what your banks tell you. The goal of security is risk management, balancing risks, investing enough in security to defeat the attacks that are likely, while still having a system that you can actually use and do something productive with. The best, most secure computer is one that's not connected to the internet, that's not plugged in, that's not running, that's not on. But that's not useful. And by adding utility, we create vulnerabilities. The goal of computer security is to keep systems functioning as intended, keep them functioning free of abuse from attackers. Meaning, we want to keep data accessed only by people we want to have access to this data. We want to secure access to resources and capabilities. We don't want anyone from the internet to print on our printers, just us, so that we're not wasting toner and paper and hearing a printer going all the time. We want to have privacy and anonymity. We don't want every single thing we do to be tracked, but yet we want to do all of this with an adversary on a budget. We don't have infinite resources to spend on security, and there is an adversary, and an intelligent adversary. So failures in security are not random failures. They are intentional attacks 
by an intelligent adversary attempting to break the system. There's some goals of computer security. First goal, or particularly as we think of network communications, one goal is confidentiality. Non-public information should be accessible only to authorized parties. There's two kinds of data that we talk about in generally in security. Data at rest or data in motion. At rest means stored. So data on a hard drive, data on a flash drive. Data in transmission is what's in motion. That's data being sent over the internet. So I have a file on my computer. I send it to another computer. It's at rest when it's saved on my hard drive. It's in motion when it's on the internet being sent to the other computer. There's technical means to do confidentiality. So encryption is a technical mean. We encrypt data when we're sending it. So only the person with the encryption key is able to read it. There's also procedural means. If you have a vault filled with tapes that's storing lots of sensitive information, you might have guards. You might have guards holding guns. You might have locks and doors and access control using facial recognition or using access cards or keys. These are all procedural means to achieve security. Integrity is another goal of computer security. Integrity is that data, software, hardware remains unaltered. That the data isn't modified, tampered with, changed. Now, if you're familiar with a checksum, checksums can detect this. Checksums are designed to, if a fail, if a bit error is, a, is occurs, so a bit gets flipped while transmission, a checksum can detect this. However, an adversary can change the data arbitrarily. It may be the case that you have a checksum for your data. If a bit gets flipped, it's detected. Or 10 bits get flipped, it's detected. But what if 15 bits get flipped in exactly the right way that overrides your checksum so the checksum now works again? Well, this is the kind of attack that an intelligent adversary will do. So if an adversary is intentionally tampering with your data, they'll also tamper so that the checksums work. Right? And so we want to ensure integrity against such attackers, integrity of data, including data in motion, data at rest. And integrity can also include integrity of people. You imagine bribery or corruption. Right? If you're guarding your data, well, the guards may be bribed. And so now integrity for your procedural means of guards refers to the integrity of the guards themselves. Authorization is another goal of computer security. Here, the idea is that resources are only accessed by entities that are allowed to access it or authorized to access it. So there's a resource, there's a resource owner, the resource owner approves entities to access the resource. Not everyone can print, you have to have an account to print, someone owns the printer and manages the accounts, other people have accounts and can print. And there's a variety of ways of achieving authorization, used access control mechanisms typically, things like passwords are a form of authorization, key cards are a form of authorization, keys themselves, physical keys. And as well, availability. Availability is the idea that information, services, and resources can actually be used, that they're useful, that you can access them and do something with these computer systems that the printer is available to print. Again, it's easy to achieve security if you disconnect everything from the internet and turn it off, don't give it power, and leave it in a closet. But it's not very useful. And a topic that we'll actually discuss in this course is a denial of service attack, which is a specific kind of attack against availability of systems. There's an acronym CIA, which is often used in this context. So confidentiality, integrity, and availability, or confidentiality, integrity, and authorization, or authentication, or both confidentiality, integrity, availability, authenticity, authorization, and so forth. 
but the four main goals for this course are confidentiality, integrity, authorization, and availability. Security policies is a specification of the rules and practices of what is and is not allowed for a computer system. Security policies are designed to protect assets. So anything that has an abuse potential could be considered an asset. Information, software, hardware, computing, communication services, access to resources. These are all assets. Security is designed to protect assets. And a security policy specifies what is and is not allowed. That's the, the policy. So the policy is the goals that you're trying to achieve. The mechanism, a security mechanism, is what actually implements the security policy. Ideally, the mechanism will enforce the rules outlined in the policy. When a mechanism fulfills a policy, that's a good thing. Sometimes you may have a mechanism designed to fulfill a policy, but the mechanism doesn't actually fulfill that policy. We'll get to an example of that shortly. Mechanisms can be computer things like passwords, but they can also be protocols that humans follow, such as when you leave the office, you take all the valuables and you put them in a safe. That's a mechanism. It's a protocol that every day when the last person leaves the office, they take all the valuables, they put them in the safe. So the safe being a secure space and the humans following the protocols form the security mechanism and the policy might be don't leave valuables lying around when no one's around. So let's consider an example of this. Phone security. A policy might be work phone must never be physically handled except by owner. So there's a work a company, they give out work phones, they give out work phones to employees, and the policy is you cannot give your phone to someone else. If you have a work phone, it must only be physically handled by yourself, the owner of the work phone, no one else. That's the policy. A mechanism would then be keeping the phone on a person at all times. It'll just always be in my pocket. So no one else can handle it except me because it's either me handling it or me carrying it. Now, maybe I don't want to have to sleep with this work phone in my pocket. So maybe then I have a mechanism of keeping the phone on my person or in a locked compartment that only I can access. So either one or the other. These are different mechanisms. But the goal is that these mechanisms are implementing the policy. The policy describes what should happen or what shouldn't happen. The mechanism is the technical or procedural means by which this policy is then fulfilled. Note that these have assumptions. These mechanisms, as to whether or not they achieve the policy, we have to consider their assumptions. The locked compartment, for example. Well, if I'm the only person who can physically access it, that's good. But maybe someone else has the key as well. And then the mechanism might not guarantee that the policy is fulfilled. Just because a compartment is locked doesn't mean the only person who can access this locked compartment is the person who owns a phone. Or that the integrity of the person's pockets cannot be compromised. That is, I have a phone in my pocket but someone is able to pick my pocket and remove the phone without my knowledge. This would be, again, an assumption made by the first mechanism to keep the phone on the, my person at all times, keeping it in my pocket at all times. I want that to fulfill the policy, but I'm making the assumption that my pockets cannot be compromised in order for it to actually fulfill that policy. Another example, my bicycle. I might have a policy that only I may use my bike. And the mechanism by which I achieve this policy is that I use a bike lock. When I'm not actually using my bicycle, I have it locked, or I store it in a locked space, such that I'm the only one who has access to this space. 
or the ability to open this lock. This hopefully then achieves the policy of only I may use my bike. Uh, but again, there's an assumption that no one can use my bike while I'm using it, because while I'm using it, it's not locked. I'm making the assumption that while I'm using my bike, no one else can use it, but someone could jam the wheels with a stick and steal it. Or someone could pick the lock. So while the mechanism seems like a good mechanism for the policy, it's making these assumptions, and these assumptions may not be true. And when they're not true, we have a security attack. Another example, my produce shopping. The policy for when I purchase my produce might be that no minors are allowed in the cannabis store. The mechanism to enforce this is an inspection of a government-issued identification. Assumptions, forged identifications are easy to detect. That if you forge an identification, it's easy to just observe that it's a forged piece of identification and reject it. Otherwise, the identification can attest to the age of majority and thereby allowing the merchant into the cannabis shop. Another example, bank security. Policy. The bank only gives information about an account to the account owner. It's a good policy. You wouldn't want the bank just giving banking information to anyone who happens to ask. How do they enforce this? Well, when you call them, they ask for your birthday. The assumption that the only person on the planet who knows your birthday is you. So if that assumption is correct, it's a great mechanism to achieve the policy. You call the bank they don't know who's calling them, so they ask that your birthday, when you give them the correct birthday, or mother's maiden name, or whatever other piece of information that they happen to think is secure, they then give you as much information and allow you to do whatever banking you want to do. But if the assumption is false, if there is another person on the planet who knows your birthday, or your mother's maiden name, or your grade 2 teacher's name, then this isn't a good mechanism. And it's worth noting how many grade 2 teachers can implement banking attacks on so many people on this planet. Now, the other interesting thing about security mechanisms is that a security mechanism implies a policy objective. Sometimes you can't or you don't know what the policy objective is, you only see the security mechanism. And the interesting thing is that a security mechanism on its own indicates that there was some policy objective that existed and it's now here to try to achieve that objective. And so I want you in this course to think in this reverse way where you look at a mechanism and you divine the policy. You infer what the policy is just by observing the mechanism. And in this process, you can figure out the attack. Because when you see a mechanism and you figure out what the policy is, this difference between what the mechanism does and what the policy wants is where you find attacks. It's in the gap between what the mechanism does and what the policy wants where there is a space of attacks. Again, attacks often result from mechanisms' assumptions. The mechanisms make assumptions, the assumptions are wrong, and then you have an attack. And when you start noticing it, when you'll start seeing things like this everywhere. You'll start seeing everything in terms of security mechanisms attempting to fulfill security policies. You'll see it in places you'd never thought before. Once you start looking at the world with this lens that there are security mechanisms everywhere, and behind them is some hidden security policy, you'll start seeing it everywhere. Another way of looking at security is theoretically, 
where we have a system, and the system has states that it can be in. And now the policy is a function on states, indicating which are secure or authorized, allowed states, and which are insecure or unauthorized or disallowed states. So, for this example, let's consider the lock the door when no one's home policy. There are four possible states because there's two binary variables. Either someone's home or no one's home, and either the door is locked or the door is not locked. Two binary variables, four possible combinations, four therefore states. We say that the policy is violated if the system goes into an unauthorized state. You know, if the policy was about the bank, someone other than you gets the bank information, that's an unauthorized state. The goal of a mechanism, like knowing your birthday, is to make sure that that system never goes into that unauthorized state. So we can look at this now visually. Again, two binary variables, four possible states. We have the door is locked and no one's home, the door is locked and someone's home, the door is unlocked and no one's home, and the door is unlocked and someone's home. And we can move between these states, so the idea of a finite state machine should be entering your mind. When you leave, then it goes to the no one's home state. When you arrive, it goes to the someone's home state. And similarly, when you lock or unlock the door, you switch from the locked to unlocked state. And of course, if no one's home, then you can't lock it because the person with the key is the person who should be home. Now, one of these states is unauthorized. We want it that the door is locked when no one's home. That's the policy. So unlock door, no one home, that's the bad state. That's the unauthorized state. So the policy is to not enter the state. The policy is a statement about states that are bad. Mechanisms are things about transitions. Mechanisms are trying to prevent a transition to a bad state. The policy tells us what state is bad. The mechanism tells us which transitions are bad. A security attack is a deliberate action which, if successful, causes a security violation. An attack vector is a sequence of steps required to carry out a security violation, the security attack. Attacks exploit vulnerabilities, things like misconfigurations, unsafe defaults, design flaws, implementation flaws. You can design a system poorly so it has a security vulnerability, or you can take a good design but implement it poorly so that the implementation has a security vulnerability. For a design flaw, every implementation will likely have this. For an implementation failure, it's just that particular implementation. The source of an attack, we call it the threat agent. We call it typically an adversary, if we're talking theoretically, or we call it an attacker, if we're speaking in terms of systems. And we'll try to use the correct nomenclature throughout this course, in a, in, a, in a sense, the first third of the course will be more concerned with adversaries, and the second two-thirds of the course will be more concerned with attackers. And again, they're the same thing. It's just typically when we're thinking in terms of security, in terms of as a theoretical thing, we refer to an adversary existing, whereas when we're talking about an actual computer system that's on the internet, it's attacked by an attacker, not an adversary. A security threat is any combination of circumstances and entities that may harm assets through a security violation. Now, the mere existence of a threat agent and a vulnerability do not imply an attack. So you can have someone who is capable of attacking your system, and you may have a system that's capable of being attacked, but it doesn't mean that there will be an attack. The attacker might not care, might be indifferent. There might be not enough motive, not enough incentive. They might not have enough resources. It may be possible. Maybe it's just a little bit hard so they don't bother. You have to remember that the attacker has a goal and a budget. The goal could be to harness a resource, extract data, deny service, tamper with data, cause mischief. Whatever the attacker's goal is, they'll have one. 
And if attacking your system doesn't help them with their goal, then they won't attack your system, even if they could and it was easy and your system was available to be attacked. It has to align with the attacker's goals. And the attacker has a budget. They have time, money, and abilities. It might The attack might be out of their abilities, or just take too much time, or cost too much money. So let's look at another example, host security policy. The policy might be, no one is permitted inside the house unless accompanied by a resident. And when you think of it, the policy of lock the door when no one's home, it's really trying to achieve this goal, that people who are not authorized to be in the house are not in your house. Or in this case, they're allowed to be in your house as long as there's a resident of the house who's there to accompany them, to make sure that they don't, for instance, take any items. Second part of the policy, only residents may remove objects from the house. So, if a non-resident is unaccompanied, they might remove an object. So with this example, this house security policy, no one permitted inside unless accompanied by a resident. Only residents may remove objects from the house. I want you to pause and reflect on what is the security, what would be a security violation of this? What is a vulnerability? What is an attacker? What is an attack vector? And what is a threat? And feel free to be as creative as you want. The point is to map these basic concepts to this situation of a house where non-residents may, may are not permitted to enter or remove objects or unaccompanied, enter unaccompanied or to remove objects in the house. An example of an implementation flaw for a security mechanism, there could be a policy that says the gate may only be opened by someone inside the courtyard. So there's a courtyard and perhaps the building behind the courtyard, that door is left un unlocked because otherwise people get stuck outside when they just go out for a smoke or something. So the building is unlocked, but the courtyard itself is not publicly accessible. It's locked. Now, the mechanism to implement this could be that there is a lever on the courtyard side of the door. So on one side of the door, you have a lever, you can turn it, it's a handle, you open it and you can leave, so for fire safety. But on the reverse direction, from the outside world looking in, it's there's no handle, there may not even be a key or anything like that, it's just a, a flat surface. There's no way to open the door from the outside. Or at least that would be the goal. But this mechanism assumes that the lever can only be turned by someone inside the courtyard. That is, you ha the only way to maneuver, to manipulate, to interact with this lever that opens the door is to actually physically be on the courtyard side of that door. But what if the door has is made of bars instead of a solid material? Or what if the door is solid, but the fence is made out of bars, and you can just reach through the fence with your arm and open it, and thereby open into the courtyard where you come every day with your bicycle, and it's more convenient to go this way, so you just do it like that. This is an example of an implementation flaw, but importantly, not an attack, because the person doing it had permission to actually be on that side of the courtyard. So, no attack actually occurred in this example. There's no such thing as perfect security. Security violations have costs. But so do security countermeasures or protections. And security involves risk assessment to analyze these factors and estimate risk. How much, how many resources, how much budget should be allocated to these systems depends on what these systems are doing and how bad a security violation would be for these systems. 
There's a, a concept of quantitative risk assessment, which tries to compute numerical estimates of risks, and qualitative risk assessment, which basically ranks or orders risks or puts them into buckets like very low probability, very high probability, very low cost, very high cost. And this allows you to establish priorities. And risk is the threat times the existence of a vulnerability times the cost. So you can have low cost, high threat or low threat, high cost, representing the same effect of risk. As an example, risk due to lava flows. So, houses are vulnerable to lava. And the cost of a lava flowing through an asset like a house is very large. It's effectively the, the value of the house, which is a, typically an expensive asset. And we know that houses are vulnerable. But there's very little risk if there aren't any volcanoes nearby. So even though houses are vulnerable, there is a vulnerability to lava flows, and the cost is very large. If you don't happen to live near any volcanoes, the risk is very low as a result, even though the cost would there be high. So the risk is zero if the threat is zero, even if the cost is huge. Why is security challenging? There's a number of reasons. First, there is an intelligent and adaptive adversary. This is an adversary who can induce zero probability or low probability faults. They can do arbitrary behavior. They can give values as input but would never be given normally. You might have a web form where you select a number and then it sends it over the internet. But the attacker can craft their own HTTP requests. They don't, they're not limited to whatever client-side JavaScript you're running that would check to make sure that the value being submitted is a, is a number within range. So adaptive adversaries can do things that aren't simply random failures. They can do arbitrary, intentional failures. Second, security is challenging because computer systems are built on abstractions. We don't think about transistors when we're writing a C program, and we don't think about memory management when we're writing a JavaScript program. There's levels of abstraction, and computer science is this art of abstraction where we get one part working perfectly, and then we forget all the details and just use a simple interface. We have wires and transistors, and we use that to build CPUs that allow us to then write programs using instruction sets, assembly. And then we have a way of compiling C into assembly so that we can just write it in C. And then we have a way of writing a C program that simulates Python programs, known basically Python because it's written in C, and now we don't even need to worry about a lot of these details anymore, about electricity and wires. We've abstracted these all away. But attackers will use these details because these abstractions are where mechanisms, assumptions, fail. We make an assumption based on an abstraction that we have, but that assumption may be wrong because of the actual details of the implementation. And it's these details that the attackers use. Why is security challenging? It's an evolving field. The adversaries evolve with the defenses. This gives it the notion of an arms race. It's not the case that we build something that works and then we're done. We build something, the attacker finds flaws, we fix them, but the attacker finds new flaws. As we have better defenses, the attacker gets better attacks. 
We build a 10-foot wall, the attacker builds a 11-foot ladder. We build a 12-foot wall, the attacker adds two more feet to their ladder. Security is challenging because computers evolve faster than security. There's always new programs, new libraries, new web frameworks, features, patches, complexity, vulnerabilities outscale lines of code. It's not that if you have a thousand line program, 10% of those lines will have bugs that are security bugs. And so if you have a million line program, it's still 10%. As systems get more complicated and more pieces are interacting, the possibility of vulnerabilities from these interacting components outpaces just the size of those components. Another reason why security is challenging is that we have backwards compatibility for all sorts of computer systems. We're doing things with our computer systems today because of decisions that were made in the 70s or earlier. And we just continue to support these decisions that were made a long time ago. Or to support old versions of operating systems or old versions of web browsers or old versions of JavaScript just so that no one has anything ever break. But the cost of all this backwards compatibility is frequently manifested in security vulnerabilities. Why is security challenging? Because of asymmetries. The defender, the good guys, have to defend all fronts, all fronts security. A castle has a moat all the way around it. You have locks on every door. You close every window. The attacker needs to find only one weakness, one unlocked door, one shallow part of the moat, one window that's left open. Not every defense has to fail for the attacker to win. Only one has to fail for the attacker to win. Like the existential qualifier and the universal qualifier for all and there exists the defender has for all possible vulnerabilities make it secure the attacker has find there exists one vulnerability and attack it. there's an asymmetry in that defenses are public but the attacks are private the attacker can see the locks the guards the cameras the security mechanisms that are in place they can study them and scrutinize them plan their attack, but the defender doesn't see their plans or schemes. The attacks can be devised in private, but the defenses are made public. Attackers are nimble. Defenders have sunk costs. If I spend a huge amount of money deploying a moat, and then an attacker invents a boat, I still have the moat that I built that's now useless in light of the technology of a boat. And the attacker can wait to see what the defenses are and change what they do. Decide to go this way instead of this other way without having ever sent, spent any cost in either direction. Only once they've seen what the defenses actually are. The attackers have no rules, whereas the defenders have protocols. The defenders, if you're running a web service, you have to speak HTTP, and HTTP is a protocol, so you'll speak that protocol. If you're running an FTP server, you speak the FTP protocol. These protocols are well known. The attackers don't have to follow these same rules. There's an asymmetry in that attackers can do nothing, while defenders have to offer services. Again, good security is not connecting to the internet and not having power and not running your computer. But that's useless. The defenders are trying to do something. They're trying to run a web service. The attackers don't have to do anything. They don't have the burden of running vulnerable web services. All they have to do is find one they want to attack and attack it. 
There's an asymmetry in that the attackers are typically criminals, while the defenders are following laws. And when you're a criminal, you have a lot more options available to you in mounting attacks than if you were following laws, because you're no longer bound by laws. So the attackers are criminals, and this is yet another asymmetry. Why is security challenging? Well, there's minimal deterrence. The internet hugely facilitates anonymity. Now, keep in mind, the internet isn't anonymous. However, it is greatly facilitating an anonymity nevertheless. Attacks can come from anywhere on the planet, and attacks can have a great scale with very little cost. The attacker doesn't need to travel around the world to do these attacks. They can do many attacks from one single place and do so without having an obvious person attached to who is mounting these attacks or from coming from a jurisdiction where there's not much government interest in investigating the attacker. Why is security challenging? Security has costs. There's overhead. There's burden. It takes time to deploy security. Security is also hard to measure. You can spend a million dollars on some security feature. Was it worth it? Did it work? If you hadn't done it, would it have worked? If you never have ever locked your door, would it have ever actually mattered? Is it likely that someone is actually trying to open your door and when they see it's locked, they give up and leave? Nevertheless, we all lock the door. Was it worth it? Was this time cost of locking the door and unlocking all the time, was it actually worth it? What is the value of a lack of disaster? How do you know if there would have been a disaster and what would have happened? And how do you measure that? How do you justify this to higher up people who only care about profit money or something like that? How do you explain to them that, yes, this is a large cost, but it was worth it to prevent a disaster? Often, Vulnerabilities, breaches, security problems occur later with distance from the attack, distance from decisions that were made that allowed it, distance from incompetent decisions that may have been responsible for it, so that it's no longer directly connected. This problem was a result of this bad decision that was made. Why is security challenging? Market economics. Those in a position to actually allocate resources to security don't benefit the most. And if they don't, then they won't. Another way to think of it is that security is a tax. It's a tax that we all pay everywhere, all the time, constantly. Every time we lock the door, we're paying a tax with our time and effort to lock the door because of security. Every time we buy something from a store and it costs a, some a tiny amount extra because of shoplifting, that's a tax that everyone is paying. Having guards at stores means things cost more because that guard is making a salary providing security. This is a tax that then everyone pays. Why is security challenging? Bad design. Security mechanisms are plagued with bad designs that make it hard or inconvenient to work or that are confusing, that don't, aren't clear, that don't provide obvious benefit. Users will bypass these if they don't see why it's necessary. Users are often the ones who are responsible for violating security. Security mechanisms that are hard to use properly. Uh, their expression there is one-click security is one-click too many. That is, if you have to have users click the checkbox when they're, for instance, setting up some web service to click the checkbox to say, make this a secure, if they have to do that, that's not going to happen. Why is security challenging? Because... We can't expect formal training for regular computer users on their computer. We can't expect, we, we may be able to expect this for employees, 
who have to go through some training mechanisms and there's policies that govern it, but a regular person just using their computer, we cannot expect any formal training whatsoever as it relates to security, which means we have to design security for this person. Why is security challenging? Because social engineering works. Where you call someone up and get them to tell you their password by pretending to be someone that they're expecting to talk to and might have asked for this sort of information. Social engineering is an extremely common form of attacks on computer systems and doesn't involve any programming expertise or computer knowledge whatsoever. It just involves the confidence to be able to lie to someone and get information from them. Why is security challenging? Because of government obstacles. The governments have wanted to monitor communications between people since the beginnings of the internet, and as a result, sound policies like strong encryption by default or using encryption for all communication on the internet, these were made reticent by the governments who wanted to actually monitor communications. And so having an impediment to having strong security has made stapling it on after the fact more challenging. Security is an art in the sense that there is no protocol you can simply follow, no checklist, no step-by-step -step sequence of instructions to do, and then you have security. It's an art because of this adversary, this intelligent adversary who's adapting and following. Nevertheless, there are design principles that are recommended in the design of any system so as to achieve security. And we're going to go th now through these design principles, and we're going to see them come up again and again and again throughout this course. Because whenever we discuss some aspect of security or an attack, we can link it to one of these design principles that was either violated or not, not kept when de deploying the system, or the design principle is why the system works and worked the way it did. So now let's begin with the design principles. Design principle one, simplicity and necessity. The idea here is that designs should be kept small and simple, minimizing functionality. We want to disable functionality that we don't need, that we won't use. It should be, by default, disabled. So if you're running a server that needs to host a web server, you shouldn't, by default, also have all sorts of other services that aren't going to be used. A file FTP server, or a Samba remote file service share. All of these things shouldn't be offered because they represent an attack surface. And the larger the attack surface, the more opportunities an attacker has to attack your system. So the smaller and simpler a system is, the easier it is to assure its security. And by reducing the amount of functionality that is available but shouldn't be used, the better it is and the easier it is to secure that system. Design principle two, safe defaults. The key here is that default settings aren't going to change for a large part of the computer using population. So if you have a default setting that is not secure, that is you have to go out of your way to turn security on for some reason, then you're going to have many people deploying it insecurely. So firewalls, for instance, when you install a firewall in your house, they block the ports by default, and then you allow the ones, you allow ports that you want to have able to be reachable. You should encrypt your communications by default. You should use TLS or HTTPS, and we'll, we'll cover exactly what that is later in this course. You should be using that by default instead of using HTTP by default and only using HTTPS if, it, if HTTP isn't available. In a real-world example, when traffic lights fail, they blink red. 
They don't simply turn off or blink green or show green or something like that. The fail-safe setting, the safe default, is if there is no signal, they don't know what to do, they blink red. If you're in a building that has a fire and a fire alarm is going off, doors that might have been locked become unlocked so that you can actually reach exits. Whereas normally the doors might be locked because they, that represents a security mechanism. The default setting for an emergency is to unlock them so that people can egress. Another related idea is that you should favor permission, also known as whitelists, allowed lists, over explicit exclusion, also known as blacklists, or things that are forbidden. So it's better to specify what's allowed than what's not allowed. Because what's not allowed might be a long list, and maybe you're not creative enough to think of every possible thing that should be on that list, whereas only specifying the things that should be allowed is easier. You allow network traffic on port 80 for HTTP and port 443 for HTTPS. That's it. Not that you disallow some port that you know has a security vulnerability attached to it or is running an insecure service or shouldn't be used and you list all the bad ports you can think of. Instead, block all the ports except the ones that you want to actually permit. And this design should be fail-safe in the sense that when something fails, it should fail closed instead of opened. In this sense... If you're unable to, for instance, verify the password of someone, someone enters a password, but the password database is down, instead of allowing them access because you can't verify their identity, so just let them through, you know, so that they're not inconvenienced, the, that's, that is one design, uh, part, part of the design space. But the other part of the design space, which represents a fail-closed component would be you can't verify whether or not the password is right so you don't let them in even if it was the right password even if they are inconvenienced another example related to this concept is for instance an unlikely country um, being the source of some network traffic so for instance if you run a computer that's connected to the internet you're going to see lots and lots and lots of attacks and people trying different passwords, people trying to log in as different users, people trying to do various exploits that are well known. And when you look to see where they're coming from, oftentimes they're coming from places that are nowhere connected where you wouldn't expect to see any network traffic at all. There's no reason why IP addresses on the other side of the planet should be the only ones connecting to this, com this computer. So a safe default is to simply disallow all of this network traffic altogether from IP addresses that are nowhere near anywhere reasonable to be accessing these machines. And while not the, uh, the guaranteed solution to this problem, it does remove a huge amount of this sort of network traffic. And we're going to have, later in this course, exercises related to this where I've set up a honeypot machine that's been accessed by various computers on the planet, and you can analyze the network traffic and see who's talking to it. Another example of default, safe defaults, is default passwords. Your router, if it's a, the kind of router that has the password admin admin, or ad, root slash admin, or something like that, or just in this one case, change me, or change me too, this, this is known. D these default passwords are known to the internet. So if your router has one of these default passwords, it's not secure. The idea is that when you get a router, you set it up, you change the password. You don't use admin admin. That would be insecure. You change it. But for most end users, changing the router password is a absolute non-important chore, meaningless activity. You can't even explain why it would matter. But actually, it does, in fact, matter. Because any app that you have running on your phone that connects to the router could, if it knew admin admin, could connect to your router and change the settings. And there's lots of attacks that can happen if the attacker is able to gain access to your router. So not changing the default password is extremely dangerous. But it is a design failure of the companies that provide these routers that require them to be changed by normal users under the expectation that a normal user would actually do this.
That's the, the design failure here. So having a safe default would be that every router gets a random password and it's written on the router, for example, and this is a more common practice nowadays. Design principle three, open design. The idea here is that security should not rely on some secret part of your design, some thing that no one knows about, or the attacker being ignorant and not knowing about it. This is how many security problems can exist, is the assumption that, well, as long as the attacker doesn't know this one piece of information, then the system is secure. So let's just hope they don't ever figure this out, or no one tells them. This is also known as security through obscurity, and in general, you should not rely on security through obscurity. You should rely on security through public analysis of your systems. You should be able to publish all of the information about your system, including the source code, and have people look at it and conclude that there's no attacks. Because if your security relies on the fact that no one knows your source code, you're going to be more insecure than a system that is open source. Because in an open source one, if you've had security problems, they might have been noticed. Someone else might have already figured it out and told you about it. But if you're relying on the fact that the attacker just doesn't have access to the source code and never will, that assumption is wrong. Because they might compromise another system that has your source code, or you might have an employee who is not on your side and tells the attacker gives the attacker the source code or tells him about this vulnerability. And this principle is also known as Kirchhoff's principle, and it represents the change from the old way of doing cryptography, cryptography to the not modern way, the new way, where before we relied on things being secret and, and no one having access to information, and now all of the cryptographic systems we have, they're all public. The only thing that changes is you use a tiny key, a 16-byte key or a 32-byte key that changes. And by changing this key, you have a security system as long as this key remains secret. But you can know exactly how everything works. And it's the same idea with a lock. We know how locks work, but without the key, you're not able to actually open the lock. Despite this, it is still useful to leverage unpredictability if there is no disadvantage. So for instance, if it doesn't benefit you to publish blueprints of a building or to publish exactly when you're not home and when you're going to be on vacation, if that doesn't provide benefit in some other way, then you might as well withhold that information. It's, there's, you shouldn't rely on the security of your house to be the attacker not knowing when you're on vacation, but you shouldn't necessarily go out of your way to inform the attacker if there's actually no benefit to doing that. Going back to this example, where I have an SSH server set up and it receives traffic from all over the internet just by being a computer all connected to the internet. If I changed port 22 to port 2222, so 22 is the default for SSH, and I just pick a different port, all of this attack traffic stops. It just stops. Because they're not targeting this machine, it's more of an opportunistic attack where they're just trying to see every single computer on the internet, which ones are vulnerable, which ones are running old versions of SSH that they can attack. And even though I shouldn't rely on the fact that I'm using port 2222 and running insecure software and be feel safe or confident because it's a, on a port that the attacker doesn't know, if there's no harm, then why not? But on the other hand, there is harm in the sense that defenders have protocols. Def the SSH service runs on port 2220, or it's rather runs on port 22, not on 2222. So for my own SSH server, I can just know that I have to connect on this non-standard port. But if I was running this on the internet for many people, it would be very inconvenient to run it on a different port because people wouldn't expect it. I'd have to explain that to everyone, and then I would also lose any security through obscurity benefits that may have. So the key is don't rely on security through obscurity, but leverage on predictability when there is no reason not to. 
Design principle four, least privilege. The idea here is that you should allocate the fewest privileges needed for a task and for the shortest duration necessary. So when you're using a computer and you need to do something as super user or as root, you use sudo and you do the command and then you, you stop being root. You don't just have a root terminal open in your corner and you just leave it open all the time in case you need to do something as root. You gain root, you do the task, and then you exit. And it, yeah, if you use the sudo command, sudo works for a short amount of time and then it stops. It doesn't, just because you ran sudo in a terminal at some earlier point in time, it doesn't retain those privileges in, uh, indefinitely. It retains them for a short amount of time so you can do a few tasks without having to enter your password every, every command, but then you lose access again. For smartphones, the permission system is built on this principle of least privilege as well. It's not that every single app can access your camera and access your microphone, access your location. They have to ask permission. There's a permission system. Apps ask for permission to access the microphone, the camera, and so forth, and you can grant it. Another way of phrasing this is the need-to-know basis. So least privilege represents this idea that you should be, you should give access to resources or access to resources for various entities only if they actually need that access in order to do their task. And if they don't need access to do their task, they should not have access to those resources. Design principle five, time-tested tools. The idea here is that established methods, well-used, well-known systems for security, these are the things that should be used. You should use well-known protocols, well-known primitives, well-known toolkits. You should not write your own crypto system. You should not write your own implementation of public key cryptography. You should take one that's already been implemented and widely used and simply use it. Because the ones that have received a lot of scrutiny are the ones that will be most widely used. And if they receive a lot of scrutiny, they're more likely to be without flaws, without security vulnerabilities. Because if you're trusting your cryptography to some software that's used by thousands or millions of programs, well, all of the people who use those programs would have an interest in that being secure. And if you use something that's used by a dozen different programs or, or just something you wrote yourself, it could very well be that there is a, a flaw. And the only person who will notice it is, is you if you're the only person actually using it. Another expression here is to not roll your own crypto. And reinventing the wheel is a really great way to learn, but not a great way to do security. So reinventing the wheel, doing something that's already been done before just for the sake of doing it so you learn how it works, that's actually great and important and useful and, and part of the education in computer science. But it's not a great way to do security. It's important to learn how it works, understand it, but then rely on the tools that already exist that are widely used instead of redoing it yourself. Design principle six, least surprise. The idea here, and this relates to users and actual human beings who have to use these systems, you should design mechanisms and interfaces for security so that they behave as users expect them to behave. That is, when something happens on a computer system, the user should be the least surprised about what happens. So if a user does something, it should do what the user thinks it's going to do. They shouldn't be surprised when it turns out that it did something completely different. And this means that you should align your design with users' mental models. And this can be hard, and this is an area of intense research, because users' mental models aren't necessarily what software developers think they should be or would want them to be. But just because it's not what they want them to be doesn't mean that's not what they actually are. And so when users have a metaphor for things, such as locking a door and key, the concept of keys to unlock and lock doors... That metaphor is a powerful thing that will carry with them when they think in terms of security. 
And maybe that's a good metaphor, maybe it's a bad metaphor. But regardless, that's the metaphor. If that's the metaphor that they actually have, that's going to inform how they think about how a system would work. And particularly, if doing an action leads to some irreversible change, then the principle of least surprise is extremely crucial. You don't want to use it to accidentally delete a bunch of files thinking they were just ejecting a CD-ROM or something like that. Another thing is that designs that are suited to only train experts or which require training to use, these should be avoided at all costs. And sometimes it's necessary, and in the intelligence community, for example, there's going to be opportunities for such training and, and, and custom tools. But for an average user, it needs to be the case that they can just sit down and use it and understand how it works and not suffer enormous security vulnerabilities as a result of not correctly selecting the right options at the right time or something like that. Design principle seven is defense in depth. The idea here is to use multiple layers, each backing up the other layer. These layers should be independent, the idea being that attackers have to defeat independent layers. To compromise a system, they need to get past the firewall into the actual local network of the, of the corporation or something, and then attack the actual system that they want to attack by finding another vulnerability or something like that. These would be multiple layers of security. Hopefully, the firewall is enough. But if it's not, then also the computers have security attached to them as well. The users have strong passwords and so forth. In the physical world, the castle has high walls and gates and a moat, and these are all different security mechanisms. And it's not, and maybe the moat is enough. But if it isn't, there's also the stone walls. Each of these should be made comparatively strong. And the reason is that attackers will always break the weakest link. This is known as weakest link security. Yet imagine a chain. A chain is comprised of a bunch of links. In order to break the chain open, you don't need to break every link. You don't need to break the strongest link. You need to break the single weakest link, and the whole chain breaks. So a defense is to strengthen the weakest link first. As well, you should assume that the attacker will bypass some layer, or some security mechanism will fail. You should assume that some of your security mechanisms will not work as intended, but you should have m enough security mechanisms or multiple kinds of security mechanisms so that despite some failing, you're still secure. Design principle eight, evidence production. You should log system activities that can promote accountability. So this might be that you can't stop the attack, but at least you've gathered information about it. You can stop similar attacks in the future. You could set off an alert. You could look for some evidence of an attack based on some evidence of, that you're collecting and shut down internet connection to a machine or something like that. So you should consider when sudo is being used by an authorized party. Whenever someone's using a sudo command, log what's happening. When someone connects to your machine, log that information. Where are they connecting from? Do they connect with a password or with an SSH key? If someone plugs in a USB stick, log that that happened. Log the time. Log the device identifier for the USB. Log what information is being sent. If someone opening a file, log that this file was accessed at this time. Log when certain files or directories, special directories are modified. We're going to discuss SSL public key cryptography and cer the certificate infrastructure later in this course. But if you're familiar with these concepts, then you could imagine that if someone installs a new certificate on your machine's list of trusted certificates, that should be logged. That's an unusual event. And a file system isn't really designed to 
report this sort of information, but a security mechanism could. It simply looks at specific files, system configuration files, things like that, and if they change, which is unusual, log that information, log the time, log why. Not only can this help find attacks that are actually happening, it can determine the effect. It can figure out what the attacker was able to do. If an attacker gains access to a machine and you log all the file accesses, well, then you know what the attacker actually accessed. And that can be useful because it allows you to say these files were accessed, these people are at risk, warn them, and so forth. But these other files weren't accessed. If all you knew was someone compromised your system and you'd have no idea what they did, then you would have to assume that all of the data has been compromised. Design principle nine, data type verification. This mostly relates to web security, which we'll get to in the final third of this course. The idea here is that if you have a computer program that takes input, especially untrusted input from any arbitrary user, anyone anywhere on the planet over the internet can provide input to your program, you have to assume that this will be used to attack your systems. So if you're making assumptions about this data, that it's not of a certain form, or for instance, you're expecting a number, you need to check that it's a number. You need to make sure that any input that you receive from the scary internet is exactly the kind, the format that you expect. If you read in a string that's a number and you use a eval-like command in Python or JavaScript to turn that into an int, it could be the case the attacker sent code and you just run eval on that code. So if you're expecting a number, you should check that it's a number. And we have ways of doing this. Regular expressions is the way. So you can define a regular expression for a number or for a float or for an email address. And then you just check to see that the input you received matches the regular expression for what you expect it should be. This is known as sanitizing your inputs. Another thing you can do is to canonicalize your input. And you should do this as soon as possible. The idea here being that if you're expecting to read a date, there's multiple ways someone could specify a date. They could specify it using two digits for the year, two digits for the month, two digits for the day. They could rotate that, the day and the month, in different ways. They could spell out April 12th, 1984. There's lots of different ways that they could write out a date. And let's say your program allows a variety of different ways of representing the date, then the process of turning it into a unique representation that your program will then work with is called canonicalizing. Another example, suppose you accept as input a word, and you turn it into a lowercase. You just want a lowercase word. If they type capitals, it's not a problem. You just make all the capital letters into lowercase. Again, the canonical version is then the lowercase version. And you should canonicalize your inputs as soon as possible and sanitize them as well. And then you can then process it and run your code and, and from that point on trust it. But until you've done this step, it should be considered potentially malicious, hostile data that has to be checked to make sure it's safe to be processed. Design principle 10, remnant removal. Here, the idea is that you want to remove all traces of critical information. If you're using cryptography, you're storing encryption keys in RAM, you should then clear out the RAM after you're done. Because the way that, for instance, the C programming language works, or C++, you allocate memory. That memory is not zeroed by default. That's just storing whatever happened to be there before. So you could have a, an encryption key, you free the memory, someone else gets that memory, and that memory has your encryption key. Now, that someone else will still be your program, but it could be your program that's doing something on behalf of an attacker, and the attacker then is able to exploit another attack to read this information directly. Now, not only have they an attack where they can read some parts of your RAM, they read your encryption keys. Right? So this is very bad. That's why the idea here, if you're working with sensitive information, as soon as you're done with it, securely delete it so that it's no longer available at all. Same with files. If you have some files and you want to make sure that they're gone, if you just delete them, it doesn't actually securely delete any of the information. You actually have to go and, for instance, 
overwrite it, and so forth. Design principle 11, reluctant allocation. And this relates to a previous design principle, which is least privilege. The idea here being that you should be reluctant to expend effort or allocate resources, particularly with unknown people. So if someone from the internet that you have no idea who they are says, hey, can you do this computation for me, this expensive computation? You should say, no, let me make sure that you're a legitimate person who actually wants this computation done. Because if you don't do that check, this could lead to what's known as a denial of service attack, where you're inundated with requests to do computation and you're not able to actually service legitimate requests because you're so bogged down with illegitimate requests. You should be reluctant to extend privileges or act on someone else's behalf. So if you have access to a printer and someone says, hey, give me access to this printer, I want to print some stuff, that should be an alarm. If they had access to that printer, they would be the one accessing it directly. You shouldn't use your privileges so that somebody else can gain access to a system. You should place the burden of proof of identity on those who initiate communication. For instance, if you get a phone call and they ask, who are you, who am I speaking with, That's, that should be a, a red flag. The bank, for instance, will not call you and ask who you are. And if you do get a call from someone who claims to be the bank, there's simply no evidence that they are the bank. You should call, you should hang up and call them back and then continue the conversation. Or if you're called by someone who wants access to some tax information or financial statements for your company. You shouldn't assume that they are who they say when you have absolutely no evidence to that effect. You should get their information, figure out how to contact them without receiving their phone number from them, figure out who they are, who they are and who they work for, and then do your own research to figure out what their number is, call them back. Design principle 12, security by design. The idea here is that you should build in security from the start. Don't staple it on at a late stage. Don't take a system that you fully designed and built and then realize, oh, well, now we need to have user accounts and passwords and you know users can't interact with other people's files and that would become a nightmare. You should be designing a system to be secure and think of the security implications of it from the beginning. Don't staple it on at the late stage. Many security problems are a result of simply adding on security as though you could sprinkle it like salt or pepper at the end of a design. You should not add a security purpose to something that was never designed to have it. And a great example of this is social insurance numbers. The social insurance system was set up and these numbers were created so that you could give your employer this number and they would pay into the social insurance system. And this was great for social insurance. But because there was no citizen registry or other way of uniquely identifying people, this number became used for many other purposes other than employers paying into a social insurance plan. Banks now want your social insurance number and they use that to prove that that's you. The tax authority takes your social insurance number. You're told, don't tell anyone your social insurance number. It's newsworthy if thousands or millions of social insurance numbers are leaked out by or given to attackers. There's a, a security purpose, these social insurance numbers, because if you know your birthday and your social insurance number and your name and your address, you can basically impersonate yourself. And if you knew it for someone else, you could impersonate that other person. You could open up credit cards and, and, and open up bank accounts and so forth. But the problem is that this number was never meant to have a security purpose. If it was, it would be possible to change it. It would be possible to say, oh, this number's been leaked. I better give, get a new one. But it was never meant to have a security purpose, so it doesn't have that feature where you can just get a new social insurance number. 
that once you are assigned one, that's your number for life, and you're told never tell anyone it, yet carry it around in your wallet at all times, give it to every employer you ever have, tell it to any bank any time they ever ask, put it on every tax form. This is a security purpose that was added to a number that was never meant to have it, and why the system is broken. You should explicitly state what the design goals are of a security mechanism. When you divine, uh, design a security mechanism, you should say what it's trying to do, what aspects of the security policy it's meeting, because this allows you to capture those hidden assumptions that may not be correct. And when you're making assumptions, you should state what they are as well. You should state that I'm assuming this is the case. The mechanism works because this is the case. And then someone else can look at it and be that might not be the case. If it involves trusting people or trusting entities, these should be explicitly stated. This system works because the this entity is a trusted entity. Then we can worry about what might happen if they aren't a trusted entity or they become no longer a trusted entity. You should state what the mechanisms are not meant to do. Because if you state what the mechanisms are not meant to do, people are less tempted to then try to get it, try, a staple on some extra purpose later that's doing that thing it was not meant to do. If you explicitly say, this cannot be used to do this, it makes it harder for someone else to come along and then do that and say, it's a good idea. Design principle 13. Security is economics. Attacks and defenses have costs. And the consequence of attacks have costs. And real-world security balances these. And design principle 14, know your adversary. Security is designed and defined relative to an adversary, an adversary who wants to break security. And understanding the adversary results in better designed security, because now you're not just throwing security around everywhere, you're actually thinking about what the goals of the attacker are, what they're trying to do, how they're going to attack, what their methods are, and building a system to thwart them. Knowing your adversary results in better security. And this is the next part, adversarial modeling. An adversarial model identifies the objectives, that is, the assets that may be targeted by an adversary, what's at risk, what needs to be protected, it identifies the methods of the attacker. So what are the attacker's techniques? What are the types of attacks that the attacker will do? It identifies the capabilities of the attacker. What resources do they have? What's their computational abilities? What are their skills? What are their knowledge? What opportunities for access to a system does an attacker have? And as well identifies their funding level. And their funding level correlates with their determination and their persistence. If they're an extremely well-funded adversary, they may continue attempting attacks long after other adversaries might have given up and moved on to other targets. A categorical schema classifies well-defined adversaries into different groups or types. So, for example, the textbook of Paul Van Orschot's Tools and Jewels gives the following categorical schema for different types of attackers. We have foreign intelligence. This would be spies from other countries. So here, it's an adversary who is funded well, funded by the government, has some level of ability to circumvent the laws, at least, of the country that they are presiding in, because as long as they follow their that foreign country's laws, and they may be shielded from other legal action. They are 
loyal in the sense to their country and motivated by whatever the goals of that foreign adversary are. There's terrorists. Here again, we have an adversary who may not care much for the law or not be too concerned about it, but they're not operating under the auspices necessarily of a government allowing them to function, but they're operating independent in a sort of lawless area, perhaps. They may be working alone or in small teams within a country. We have politically motivated adversaries. These can also be considered hacktivists in a sense. These would be people who are performing attacks, ad uh, adversaries who are performing attacks for some political goal that they have in mind, whatever that goal may be, but they are not, for instance, foreign intelligence working in, in that capacity, but they may be, for instance, in, in the case of WikiLeaks being taken down by a denial of service attack, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, or rather, the MasterCard and Visa corporations being taken down as a retaliation for them no longer processing WikiLeaks donations, those attackers who performed a denial of service attack against MasterCard and Visa, these would be politically motivated attackers. We have industrial espionage agents. So again, similar to foreign intelligence, these are adversaries who are funded by an entity, but in this case that entity is not a government agency, but rather a private corporation. And perhaps they belong to another rival company, they're given they apply for a job and they're given a job inside of another company and they are actually, while in that capacity, spying on behalf of some other company while they're in there. So again, they won't have the shield of government authorization for their activities, and but instead are operating on behalf of a private corporation. There's organized crime. This would be a number of different things that occur on the internet that involve extortion, like crypto viral extortion. This would be like BitLocker, where some attacker installs some malware in your computer and demands money so that you pay them money so that they release your files or something like this. Or the entire spam ecosystem of spammers. This is simply organized crime. There's money to be made, and thereby there are people who are committing crimes and so as to make this money. There's lesser criminals, we, we can call them as well script kiddies, people who are just curious, they're not motivated by pol politics or necessarily making money, maybe they're interested in notoriety, they just want scene cred or scene props, they're just interested in how the attacks are working, they're and curious and they have lots of time but probably not much in the way of resources to do these attacks. There's malicious insiders, for example, disgruntled employees. So a company who, that has access to a lot of data, maybe some employee be decides that what they're doing is wrong, becomes a whistleblower, collects a bunch of data to expose them, or they're passed up for some promotion or they're otherwise upset at their employer and they can then use the fact that they have insider abilities, that they have passwords, that they have key cards, that they have access to the building in order to mount these attacks and cause more damage. We have non-malicious employees, for instance, people who just find a USB stick in the parking lot and plug it into their computer and thereby compromise the security of the entire system. Right? These are people who are not actively trying to mount attacks on their employer. They're not disgruntled. They're not upset. They're not working on another industrial agent. They're not working on behalf of foreign intelligence. They're not organized criminals. They're simply people who are accidentally misusing computer systems that end up causing damage, damage to the uh, owners of those systems. And finally, there are researchers casual hackers, people who are interested in security, people who are trying to break systems so as to find security vulnerabilities so that they can publish it, warn the people that these vulnerabilities exist, make them fixed, improve the entire ecosystem, improve security for everyone. There's now bug bounty programs in many cases, so if you find a security vulnerability in many internet services or apps or programs that are widely used, you're eligible to actually receive a non- trivial amount of money, hundreds or thousands of dollars frequently, 
and and some people make use of this as a way of actually their career is simply finding bug bounties and, and collecting the reward. And the idea of a bug bounty is to sort of create an economic incentive around responsible disclosure. Because again, security is economics, and we have this situation where if an attacker finds a bug, they could sell it on to organized criminals or to other people who might be interested and, and certainly would receive more money, but this is less of an honorable course of action. But the bug bounty programs, in a way, try to establish a legitimate market for security vulnerabilities that may not pay as well, but at least corresponds to doing the right thing and not committing crimes. So people who are interested in security can look into security vulnerabilities, start exploring, start to try to find problems with systems, and if they discover one, responsibly disclose it to the parties involved, and in the, in the process of doing that, actually get some monetary reward for their work. There's different types of attacks. Uh, one important dimension is a passive attack versus an, an active attack. In a passive attack, it is noted, it is characterized by there being no difference in what transpires as a result of the attacker's presence. In the sense that the same data is exchanged, communication happens without any interference, bits aren't ch flipped, packets aren't deleted, new packets aren't added. In effect, the attacker is only able to eavesdrop, is only able to listen to the communication. So in a passive attack, the attacker might observe information, but they won't do anything like try to log in with a password that they figured out or try to guess some passwords or something like that. They're not actually interfering. If the attacker was there versus not being there, you couldn't tell if a passive attack is occurring. An active attack is when this isn't the case, when the attacker's presence actually changes what happens. They interfere with communication. They flip bits. They delete packets. They insert new packets. They modify existing packets. They take data that they've already seen and they replay it. They transmit it again. So they've seen someone already authenticate, for example, to a system. They replay that authentication. And the, if the system doesn't realize that it's an old historical transmission, it might accidentally just give them access. Right? So these are active attacks. This is where the existence of the adversary actually changes, in a sense, the transcript of communication. There's targeted versus opportunistic attacks. So a targeted attack aims at has uh, is an attack that has a specific victim in mind, has a specific organization that is trying to attack. It's not simply trying to find some computers to add to a botnet, but rather it wants these particular computers, because these particular computers have access to a lot of important information, for example. So the Stuxnet malware, which was a U.S.-Israeli um, combined effort to interfere with the Iranian nuclear program, this was a targeted attack. They didn't design it to actually attack all the computers. They designed it to attack specific computers within the Iranian nuclear program. Again, if you were to log into a CEO's uh, email account, this would be an example of a targeted attack as well. You have a specific person that you're trying to target, that you want to gain access to their emails, not just any emails. You might, if you're a spammer, maybe you want some email addresses you can control to send out spam. You don't care who they belong to. Whereas if you're logging into the CEO's email of some company, it's probably because you want to access the information that they can access. In contrast to targeted attacks, we have opportunistic attacks or generic attacks. This would be like the attacks that I showed you on that computer that I have connected to the internet. This is just attacks that occur because every single computer on the internet is being attacked at all times by various people across the internet, and they're just trying to find vulnerable computers that they can take over or gain access to and use in a botnet or these sorts of things. And as an example, bike locks are an excellent defense against opportunistic attacks. The idea of a bicycle lock is that it keeps honest people honest, in a sense. You don't have a bicycle just sitting there that someone can actually just take and ride away. 
you have to unlock it. But if someone wanted to steal your bike, it's not likely that the bike lock will do much to defend your bicycle. If they, if the attacker knows your bike, knows where you park it, knows what kind of lock you use, and wants to steal your specific bike, a bike lock is probably not going to be a sufficient defense. Another dimension of attacks, we have outsider versus insider attacks. So an outsider attack is someone who is not within some sort of network or has any formal relation with the victim. So an outsider would be when you are just attacking a company, for example, and you're not an employee, you have no connection to the company, you're completely outside of it, and you're just sending your attacks to within. An insider attack is someone who has some advantage over outsiders. So an insider might be someone who works for the company. Again, the, the disgruntled employee, for example. This would be an example of an insider attack. You have some additional capabilities com as compared to a complete outsider, and you can use these to better obtain access. Now, note that if an outsider is able to, for instance, take over a, an account because some insider, some employee has a bad password, so again, a non-malicious insider threat, you have a weak password, and someone is able to guess that password, now this outsider has elevated their privileges to become that of an insider. So this be going from an outsider to an insider might be the first step towards a more complicated and sophisticated attack. So when you're building an adversarial model, you need to have your, your threat model built alongside. The threat model is the attacks that you're considering, and if the attacks that you're considering define the defenses that you should then build to defend, the threat model includes the assets that you need to defend. The threat model includes who is your adversary. So a threat model defines the, th the attacks you're worried about, what you're trying, what you are worried about, and who is the one, who is the entity that you are actually worried about. And threat models are important because a bad threat model will give a false sense of security. If you believe that your system is secure, but you have a flaw in your threat model, well then, when the actual attack happens, you won't have even considered it. You'll have a false sense of security if you think you've resolved all possible threats owing to a bad threat model. A bad threat model can also cause you to misplace trust, have invalid assumptions, or focus on the wrong threats. Spend too much effort worrying about particular threats, like an outsider attack, when so along comes an insider one. And the NSA Snowden leaks is an example of such a of a bad threat model in the case that there was a enormous amount of effort placed on outsiders not gaining access to the system, but for an insider was able to gain access to a large amount of the system without a lot of alarms. The goal is to model an adversary, again, adversary being the theoretical concept, that then characterizes the capability of the real attacker. The threat model reasons about this abstract adversary but later comes the real attacker. And the better that your modeled adversary matches the real attacker, the better your defenses against them will be. The, this means that your real-world scenario of the attacker is the one that you imagined when you were defining your defenses. The more accurate the model, the better suited any security that is meant to thwart the adversary. So again, the insider threat example in this case, we have an adversary who knows the system, who knows the floor plan of the building, who has keys to rooms, has passwords to machines. He has friends who may be confused deputies. These are entities that are misuse their privileges because they're tricked into doing so. So the adversary may just simply be an employee of a company and is friendly with a bunch of people and in that case is able to socially engineer them oh, I accidentally forgot this, can you let me into this room, for example, when actually they shouldn't have been allowed in that room, but when presented in this way that it's not a big deal and you already know this person and trust them, this is an example of the insider threat. Frequently, systems are very well-tuned against external threats. If you think of firewalls, firewalls are things that stop most of the traffic from the internet from reaching your internal network. This is an example of strong protection against an external threat. 
However, if you have a computer within the firewall that's running malware, now it's no longer guarded by this firewall and it has free reign over the network communication. Another example is privilege escalation attacks. This is the technique that insiders can use. In this case, you have some privileges, like you have access to some rooms or some computers, and by performing further attacks, you're able to gain more privileges. You're able to exploit Starting with a small amount of privileges, you exploit the system in order to gain more. Maybe if you had no privileges whatsoever, it wouldn't be possible to do any attacks at all. But by having the ability to walk into the building and log into some computers within the building, you're able to grow your attack space and, and attack more machines in the infrastructure and thereby create a larger attack. And social engineering, this idea that you can hack humans is characterized often by this notion of privilege escalation. You start with a small amount of access, you gain a bunch of information based on that, you leverage that information to trick people into giving you more access and more information, use that access and information to trick more people into giving you more access and more information, and so forth.